Here's a special bulletin. Ma Barker is the FBI's most wanted woman. Her photo is hanging on every post office wall. They shot it out, Ma and her sons. They didn't want to hang, they died with blazing guns. And so the story ends of one who left no friends. She never could cry, but she knew how to die. This is the end of the story on Ma Barker. For this mic check, we gotta address the elephant in the room. It's me, I'm the elephant. Look at this hoodie, right? It's it's like great. It's like, you know, different colored sleeves, like this thing, like a nice logo. It has pockets, it has pockets. All of the girls want our pockets, okay? Now tell me, why doesn't this look the same way it would look like on a twink, okay? It told me to downsize, so I downsized. Why does it still look like this? Why do, like, the clumpy big hoodies not look good on women who aren't ridiculously skinny? It doesn't look like a dress. It doesn't look nice. Like, what is this? What is this? It's not giving what I wanted it to give. Look at this. I can fly. I can fly. What? I don't want to fly. I want to fucking fly away. I just remembered that I believed um, that the, the song I believe I can fly was uh, sung by a woman. <laughs> I mean, he was a bitch after all, so you know. Anyways, uh, let's just dive in. Like, what, how do you buy hoodies that are like comfy and nice when you are somebody who is a bit bigger, who isn't like a skinny fucking model bitch? And that they look nice on you. I don't like it. I love how comfy it is, but then I look at myself in the mirror. I'm like, I look like my mom is going to like admit me into a mental health institution because she thinks I gave up on life. I didn't. I don't care. I didn't. I didn't. I'm still here. God, okay, let's just start with the story. Detective unit, as you know, whatever begins must eventually end. And so here we are with the last parter on Ma Barker and her boys. And the story is going to end in like a blazing gunfire. As you would expect, because they're gangsters, okay? We are working with a lot less names. That's why, like, I made part one, like, very heavy on the name situation. And here we are kind of working with just a few names. I'm gonna recap part one now for you, because here we really have, like, Doc, so one of the sons, then the youngest son, Fred, we have Ma, and we have, like, obviously, um, Carpis, right? Alvin Carpis, like, the leader of the gang, but pretty much, yeah, we're working with a lot less names because it doesn't pay off, it seems, to be a gangster, to, like, commit violent crimes because usually you suffer a violent death. So in part one, we spoke about Ma's upbringing, how she cut ties with her whole family in a search of a better life. Then, when her husband couldn't provide, she birthed sons who will. You know, no pressure on these four boys whatsoever. As we learned, Ma did nothing to set those boys on the right path. Rather, she provided them with alibis, locations to rob, and hideouts. Once the boys were in their teens, they started with petty crimes, but soon they were robbing millions in today's money, out of jewelry stores and banks. Her oldest, Herman, died by suicide after robbing an ice plant, shooting a police officer, and not wanting to go down for killing a cop. Lloyd was in prison for 25 years, and he is going to remain there for the second part or two. If you remember, Lloyd would eventually be released and would marry and then would be killed by his wife. When Ma's youngest, Fred, was in jail, he met the secret source for the gang and their new leader, Alvin Carpis, hence Barker Carpis Gang. The last of the Barker boys was Doc, who was serving a sentence for murder of a watchman at one of their robbery locations, was released from prison and miraculously back in the gang. This just happens in this story, yeah. Being released from jail after being sentenced for life because they can just uh, bribe the officials. It just, it just happens, you know, it's like you have a life sentence and you're out. The gang of Elvin, Fred, and Doc now continue to rob mostly banks in the late 1920s and early 1930s, all the way up until 1933, which is when the Lindbergh baby kidnapping circulated the news. When we last left the Barker Carpis gang, we spoke of their last robbery that had respectfully resulted in the death of a gang member called Earl and a worthless bunch of government checks that couldn't be cashed. Ma was unhappy and so were the St. Paul's officials. 
So the decision the Barker gang made is to get into kidnapping, and it just happened to coincide with the rise of an organization that today we know as the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI at the time, would switch the focus of the organization to the infamous bank robbers, because he knew that this was how he was going to get the headlines that he needed. So, we spoke a bit about Lindbergh kidnapping at the end of part one, but there, at this moment in time, so like 1943, when they made this decision to switch from robberies to kidnapping, the baby had died, but the unknown kidnappers got the ransom money. Also, that year, in 1943, nobody was caught. Even when Bruno Hauptmann was caught, it was said that he was framed for the crime, taking the fall out of rage. So, after the Lindbergh case, kidnappings of wealthy citizens would skyrocket in the following year. So, in 1933, 27 wealthy people were kidnapped for ransom. By summer of 1932, the Lindbergh Act will be released, based off of that case. And this would let federal authorities step in and pursue kidnappers once they cross state lines with their victim. Which is just, to me, so fucking bizarre that, like, the Federal Kidnapping Act allowing the authorities to pursue individuals who are, like, committing criminal acts, kidnapping somebody and then crossing state lines did not exist for, like... It, this is, what, 90-something years, okay, 32, 90-something years ago. They just, the most common sense laws did not exist. You know, like, Amber Alert, like, that didn't exist up until, like, a couple of decades. I'm like, what the fuck are we talking about? Like, people just got away with most ridiculous shit because the laws were just not there. Like, how do you not think, like, as a kidnapper, like, the most logical thing would be, yes, to go across state lines. If they can't, then be pursued for those crimes if they go just to another state. I make it make sense. I don't know why. Like, this just took me out when I was reading this story. I was like, this did not exist up until this story. Like, what the fuck did you mean? What the fuck were you doing? What were you doing? You didn't have the technology, at least have the laws. Anyways, I lost it a bit there, but the Lindbergh Act, by criminalizing the move of a kidnapping victim across state lines, would align with J. Edgar Hoover's efforts, because many individuals involved in kidnappings also happened to be involved in bank robberies. So, essentially, the Federal Kidnapping Act would mark the FBI's initial entry into the previously inaccessible St. Paul's criminal underworld. Because now, all of those people, sort of like, you know, in that criminal underworld, so, like, the casino owner, the owner of the tavern, everybody was thinking, like, okay, what else can we do? How do we now, following, you know, these 27 examples that we have seen of kidnappings, get in on it? So, who came up with it first? It wouldn't be, obviously, one of the boys. I mean, we have already concluded that Fred and Doc were not the smartest ones in the box, but it wouldn't be Elvin here, either. It would be the big boys in town. The proposal to start kidnapping people would originate from Harry Sawyer. So, this is the guy that owned Green Lantern Tavern. And he was the one who was facing financial losses because of the decline in bootlegging profits. Now, he started working on this scheme with Jack Pfeiffer, who was the owner of the casino, and the corrupt St. Paul police chief, Big Tom Brown. Both of them possessed some prior experience in the realm of kidnapping, which we didn't know. We weren't privy to this information in part one, and now suddenly you're like, oh no, everybody's pro everybody kidnapped somebody before. <laughs> It sounds like a joke at the fucking house party. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm killed before. You're like, yeah, you shouldn't be, like, joking about that unless you've really done it, in which case, like, let me call the popo. Like, what we're we talking about. So, two years prior to this, Big Tom Brown and Jack Pfeiffer had orchestrated the abduction of a prominent gangster called Leon Glackman. Following the payment of $75,000 of a ransom, Brown and Pfeiffer would pin the blame for the kidnapping on an individual named Frank Lepre. Then, they eliminated Lepre by shooting this guy in the head three times to ensure that he couldn't dispute this version of events, the blame for the crime being pinned on him. Like, they Annalise Keating the way out of this one. If the perp is dead, he remains the perp. In a court of law, like, he remains the perp because he can't speak. So, he is the perpetrator of the crime. Things you understand. 
I'm obsessed. The casino owner, with the success in kidnapping and previously getting the ransom and obviously, you know, blaming it on somebody else so they didn't get caught, with that success, he coached the Barca Carpies gang to kidnap their next target, this guy called William Ham Jr., the president of Ham's Brewing Company. They were going to ask for a $100,000 ransom, worth about $3 million in today's money. The brewery guy, William Hem Jr., wasn't selected just because his family was rich. You see, during Prohibition, a lot of these people, yes, would brew beer for, like, public resale kind of thing, like home brewing, but secretly they would produce actual beer for the underground market. And because Hem was engaged in the illicit business of selling real beer on the bootlegging front, he would annually disperse about eight thousand dollars in protection money to a St. Paul's mob. But this protection money, technically for William Hamm, like these payments, would stop. So suddenly these like underground criminal groups weren't getting paid by him because he thought, well, prohibition was it had ended, I don't need to be protected anymore. And he was very wrong and about to suffer the consequences. So he doesn't think he needs to pay St. Paul for protection anymore, and on June the 15th, 1933, Fred and Heldin are about to show him otherwise. They would snatch William Hamm off the street outside of his office. They put a hood on his head, shoved him inside of a black coop, and then drove him to the home of a postmaster in Bensonville, Illinois, who just happened to be in on the job. I'm putting on the screen what the postmaster is. It's basically like somebody who is in charge of the post office. Do you still call them that today? I haven't heard of that. Like, I don't know what that would be called um, here in the UK, like a bossman of Royal Mail, basically. It's like the big boy. The big boy in the post business. I don't know, is there a postmaster? Does that name translate here? I am an immigrant. Get me the fuck out of here. I've just heard, like, somebody else reside, like, I don't know, some defense secretary. Oh, it's just, like, it's a shit show. Here, the politics has been a shit show for the past 14 years that I have spent in this country. Shit show, get me the fuck out of here. Anyways, so they put William Hamm, the brewery guy, in the car, right? And when the car stopped, Ham would later say that he was gently pulled out by the icy cold small hand of who he thought was a woman, implicating Ma Barker here. FBI director Hoover would report this a bit more aggressively. He would say Ma was diabolically clever at concealing getaway charts. Before a kidnapping, Ma would drive through every each of an escape route, coding every twist, turn and bump in the road, recording speeds on the curves. So, like, put this in the back of your head, okay? I don't think Ma was coding, okay? <laughs> I don't think she was, like, you know, women who code. Like, I don't think she was behind, like, coding programs, okay? Um, but pin it in the back of your head, because there might be somebody else in the future who recognized that Ma was there. She was involved to some degree. It's up to you to decide to what degree, really, because this story had been told and then retold a million times to the point where a lot of people might believe in, like, the legend, the myth of Ma Barker, instead of, like, oh, yeah, she was just, like, a normal person in this circumstance. Well, not a normal person, the person encouraging these crimes in these circumstances. She could have fucked up, okay? A lot of people had free will that they just did not exert. They did not fucking deploy that shit. So, the rumor was running that Ham was probably being held by a gambler and liquor runner named Vern Sankey. And on that speculation alone, police was after this man and they had orders to shoot Vern Sankey on sight. So the Barker Carpies gang didn't mind this ambiguity, they didn't mind again that somebody else might fall for this crime. What added to the complexity of this investigation was the presence of Big Tom Brown, who was closely aligned with the Barkers. So, in exchange for a portion of the ransom money, the police chief, Big Tom Brown, would provide the outlaws with the information about law enforcement activities, and in turn, he would divert authorities 
away when they would come dangerously close to getting to the Barkers. And this is exactly what happens in this case. So when it came to the ransom delivery here, Shotgun George Ziegler, like we spoke briefly about this guy in part one as one of the Al Capone's guys, he served as the negotiator for the ransom, and he insisted on using a Hems brewery truck for the delivery, likely to make the vehicle easily identifiable. But opting for a truck would provide detectives with an opportunity to devise their own tactics. Another St. Paul's detective managed to convince the authorities to allow him to hide in the brewery truck armed with a machine gun with the intention of not arresting the kidnappers when they were to hand over, you know, the William Ham in exchange for the ransom money, rather to kill them all on the spot. But before this plan could be executed, Big Tom Brown reached out to the Barker Carpets gang and told them about the plan that the police had had for them to assassinate them during the exchange. So the gang would instruct the police to instead abandon the delivery truck idea and transport the cash using a vehicle that was equally conspicuous but had its doors and trunk removed, ensuring that no one, armed or otherwise, could hide within it. So by June the 30th, the ransom was paid and Ham was released unharmed. He told reporters that he couldn't identify the kidnappers because he had goggles taped to his face the entire time. So they would put goggles on a man, you know, like the ones you use for swimming, but they would put tape inside of them. So for 15 days, if you are paying attention to the dates, this guy could not see shit. He gave them, like, a bit of inside info of, like, what he did notice in terms of, like, sounds and movements, right? He would say that it appeared, like, from the corner of his eye that there was a bit of a gap where he could see from the goggles, and he noticed the windows of the house in which he was placed in the second floor were boarded up. So in the room where he was, the windows were also shut off from the world. He never saw the man because even in the rare occasions when they took the goggles off of him, they would make him face the wall so that he couldn't see their faces. But he said everybody was nice to him, that like he could ask for anything that he wanted and ordered anything that he wanted. The meals in particular were good and simple. Nothing elaborate, but whoever did the cooking knew their way around the kitchen. Compliments to the chef, and also a very, very sexist comment, again implying that Ma Barker was behind the cooking. Following the safe return of William Ham, the pursuit of those behind the kidnapping would start. The police chief, Big Tom Brown, really played a huge role here, because obviously he was trying his best within that police station and within that realm to, like, divert the rest of the investigators elsewhere, not, you know, to get them to focus on the Barker Carpets gang, but also to avoid them focusing on him. So he, like, kind of told them to, like, search this cabin in uh, Lake Minnetonka, and this location was just, like, chosen by police chief and was searched solely because of his word. But this operation obviously yielded nothing more than a terrified couple that was just vacationing there. Wrongman was about to be pinned again, had it not been for the little technique of dusting that the FBI started using. Dusting for fingerprints, it was just dusting. <laughs> just like take the broom. Bariendo sin escoba. Okay. TikTok trend, don't worry about it. Barriendo sin escoba. Los líderes del género femenino, masculino y 39 tipos de gay. Señores, ustedes lo saben. A bootlegger called Roger Tau, he was apprehended by the police and was actually charged for the crime. But it soon became evident that others were responsible, despite prosecutors proceeding with this man's conviction. What exonerated Tau will be a new FBI technique called latent fingerprint identification. We go yet again back in time where I'm like, this is just, again, so bizarre. Because they would obviously have a file of these fingerprints, because how else they do it, you don't have, like, technology. But what is, like, bizarre to me is how did these criminals not, like, burn more police stations? Or, like, wherever they knew they would archive these fingerprints? Because technically that would be a very efficient way in the 1920s, 30s, like, when people started honing in on the fingerprints techniques to just eliminate them. Because then you don't have 
anything to compare them to. I just find that very bizarre. The like, criminals were just not smart enough to be like, oh, fingerprints, they're gonna become a thing one day. So let's just burn this fucking physical storage of them, literally these archival files down. Like, wait, what did they have caught these fuckers? We could, wouldn't have caught so many people. I'm not saying that it's a good effect. That, you know, I'm saying it's a good thing they haven't done it. I'm saying it's a good thing they weren't smart, but it's just bizarre to me, like, how stupid they were. Anyways, so the Hams ran some notes, right? When that whole saga happened, when William Ham was kidnapped and the ransom notes were dusted, they found not Roger Tau, his fingerprints, but Elvin Carpices and Doc Barker's. And at the time, the Bureau had, as I have mentioned, the file that contained all of these latent fingerprints impressions. Each of these fingerprints was classified separately and filed in a designated sequence, so that the later fingerprint impressions found at the scenes of the crimes can be then checked against them to establish the identity of the suspect. The authorities finally discovered how to use chemical powders in order to lift off the fingerprints and then compare them to the files that they have had. So while Tauhi and his men were acquitted on the ham kidnapping, they were found guilty of abducting a market speculator named John Factor for $70,000. And Tauhi's story ends with quote-unquote committed suicide in his cell by necktie hanging courtesy of Al Capone. While kidnapping proved to be a method that was both lucrative and also less risky than the bank robbery, it was also notably time-intensive. Like, again, paying attention to the dates, the ham kidnapping took guys, like, 15 days, where, like, you have to take care of the kidnapping, you can't really kill them, right? Otherwise, you don't get the ransom money. So, like, getting the ransom typically would take about 20 to 30 days, sometimes even longer, depending on the police, depending on the negotiations. Also, it liked the adrenaline rush of confronting a stranger at gunpoint and then making a daring escape from law enforcement. So, we know that these boys love that. They enjoyed those bank robberies, they enjoyed ju robbing jewelry stores, they enjoyed robbing clothing stores and then wearing those clothes to the next robbery. They were just fucking purely dumb. But they loved the adrenaline rush. So, briefly, they're going to go back to their old hobby of just committing different robberies. And it's gonna go as well as you might have thought it would. If you remember in part one how, like, one of the last robberies had ended when one of the gang members shot the tires of their own getaway car, then the other one shot, like, Doc Parker's finger off, like, these guys just were there for the adrenaline rush. There was not a single thought. There was nothing going on here. Just absolutely nothing. And this next one is going to prove somehow to be like one of the worst that they have done so far. So, Barga Carpe's gang briefly goes back to their first love, robberies. In September of 1933, they would target two railway express workers, robbing them of the two cash boxes containing the estimated sum that ranged from 60k to 100k, before they made their getaway. There were about 9 or 10 people involved in this robbery, so each member of the gang got away with about 7,800, that's about 150,000 in today's cash. Again, great amount of money they could have stopped, they don't. The next time around, because they're now getting bored and again need something else, they need to commit an even cockier crime, they decide to violate the city's no crime in city limits, the St. Paul's in particular, right? And they opt in to target the train station. And this resulted in a rapid and disastrous turn of events, primarily caused by the gang's own mistakes. Around 9 in the morning, members of the Barca Carpis gang, waiting in a black sedan, observed a pair of messengers that were arriving to the railway depot. Depot? Depot, my depot is not depot. Not a depot, but depot. These messengers were carrying bags of cash that were intended for delivery to the Stockyards National Bank, accompanied by two police escorts. As these messengers and police entered the railway depot offices, Doc Barker emerged from the gang's car. He took out one of the guns, 
rather shotgun and aimed it at the officer Leo Pavlak. At the same time, another gang member named Chuck Fitzgerald sprang into action and he pointed a pistol at one of the messengers. At this point, the situation was tense, but still under control. That was until Officer John Yeeman entered the scene after his coffee break, and nobody expected this guy to enter the scene at that point. So, a nervous member of the Barker gang called Bill Weaver. He was sitting in the back seat of the gang sedan, and he reacted impulsively by firing this shotgun and tragically hitting Yeeman, so the guy just coming off from his coffee break in the head. Doc Barker now, believing that the shot came from the police, he was st- just started swearing and proceeded to almost decapitate Officer Pavlak with a sword of shotgun. Fred Barker, thinking that the fight with the police had begun, he also opened fire and then fatally striked him and again in the head and the chest. In this chaos, Fred started firing his pistol in a frantic circle, like he is, fi- he is not even looking who he's targeting. And he unintentionally hit fellow gag member Chuck Fitzgerald. In response, Chuck cried out, leading Doc to assume that the police had targeted Chuck. Doc then, in a wild frenzy, drew two 45s and unleashed a hail of bullets into the post office across the street. Eventually, he would seize the messenger's money bags and hastily they would make their getaway. Honestly, even the Looney Tunes would not like put their cartoon characters, like the actual animals, in these situations because even they would be like, yeah, the kids are gonna find this too fucking ridiculous. Like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, did they not communicate about this? Did they not think to like just give signals to each other? Something? They have been now robbing banks, people, different stores for about four to five years, and they're making amateur mistakes. This is a sideline, by the way, but one of the boys in the gang now was called Machine Gun Kelly, and if you know shitty music (laughs) and, like, shitty dating history of Megan Fox, you know that uh, there is a rapper that she had been dating that is called Machine Gun Kelly. That was such a creepy relationship. But anyways, I read it in the book, right, when I was reading Chris Ensis book, and I was like, oh, oh, I never thought that the rapper's name is actually inspired by a gangster, by a criminal, so then I went and googled one of his interviews, and yes, Machine Gun Kelly got his name because of the rapid-fire delivery when he was, like, 15 years old and started doing shows, but his name is also a reference to George, Machine Gun Kelly Barnes, and George Barnes was a well-known criminal who was given a prison sentence for life, for engaging in illegal liquor trafficking, kidnapping, and bank robbery. And he was, yeah, one of the people on um, in the gang. I don't know if he was actually on this robbery, but I just read that in the book, and I was like, um, great, great inspiration behind the name. Love that for you. Love it, love it. So following this robbery, right, the Barker Capis gang, is now in a car, they're patting themselves on the shoulder, like, oh my god, good one, we got away with the money, like, that was such a sick police fire that we avoided, and then they realized, oh, we were just shooting at each other. Well, that's a bit fucking embarrassing, like, how do you move on from there? You can't even look at each other in the eye, like, oh, uh, uh, that was you shooting, not, not, no, not a single shot was fired by the police, not a single one. You might have noticed why this went so badly, because Alvin Karp is the brains of the operation. He wasn't on the job. He wasn't on this raid, but at this point, like, his levels of paranoia were through the roof. And this is about to showcase itself with the next face-off, with who this gang also thought was the police. So, on this certain day, Doc Barker and Alvin Karpis were driving in the Chevrolet, when they became aware that another car, which they believed had two police officers inside, was tailing them. So, to invade them, Doc and Ellie turned into this alley. Doc and Alvin, like, they were kind of turning this car, leading this vehicle into this hidden alley, and then, once they found themselves in a hidden enough of a spot, Alvin exited the car, taking the Tommy gun and just firing discharging all the bullets, emptying this gun of the fucking bullets. But then they approached this car, obviously knowing that whoever was there uh, is now dead, 
And they realized that this was just an employee of Northwestern Airlines, a guy called Roy McCord, who just assumed that Elvin and Doc were a pair of peeping toms and like followed them to make sure that they don't like molest somebody. So also you know that Elvin, just based off of like the interviews that we have watched of him, thought that this was probably a waste of bullets and not a waste of a human life. But with their wounds now, because this person apparently as well shot at them, they go to Ma. And Ma was just not happy. Journalists would later write that Ma had a vision. She wanted more for her boys than a string of petty crimes to call their own, where danger was assured and financial independence was always in question. So based on Ma insisting, actually, after the disaster at the railway station, the Barker Carpies gang decided to return to the much less exciting game of kidnapping. Their next target was a guy called Edward Bremer, who was the corrupt St. Paul Bank president. So the plans started getting into motion, like, to kidnap this man. I might have mentioned this guy in part one as a source of money laundering, but he was the son of Adolf Bremer, owner of Schmidt Beer Brewing, as well as the nephew of Otto Bremer, chairman of American National Bank. So the Bremers were also rich as fuck, is what you need to know in this situation. It was said by the FBI that Ma was the advisor here too, and knew what was going to happen from the get-go. Each morning, Ed Bremer would bring his daughter to school and wave her goodbye at 8.25 a.m. exactly, and then he would drive off to work. This is a note to everybody, never have the exact same routine, routine, never have the exact same routine, okay? Always have the true crime brain going on in your head. I am like a routine offender. Sometimes, and then I catch myself, I'm like, okay, no, please choose a different fucking street. You never fucking know. You never know if somebody's, like, peeping, if someone's stalking, like, choose a different routine. No, don't be a routine slut. It's not the time, it's not a place to be a routine slut, ever. Cool, Ed was, he didn't know, he didn't have my advice. So, on January the 17th, 1934, this routine of his is going to be interrupted after he dropped off his daughter at school. He started driving away. When Elvin Carpis suddenly approached the car, and he approached it from the driver's side window at the stop sign, taking out the firearm and instructing Bremer to either change seats or face dire consequences. As Elvin would force the door to open, Bremer shifted over, complying with the demand. And at the same time, Doc Barker would reach into the passenger's side and render Bremer unconscious by striking him with the butt of his 45 caliber pistol. Doc then taped the pair of goggles onto Bremer's face and then placed a gag in his mouth, securing it with a piece of rope. While this was happening, cars behind them just honked their horns at what I thought was nothing more than an annoying delay as the cars were rushing away from the scene. They would drive Ed to their St. Paul location, and once he regained consciousness, he was forced to sign three pre-written ransom notes that could be sent to his father. They then abandoned Bremer's car for the police to find later, and because they kind of would, like, smack this guy around with a gun, there was blood in the car as well, so they knew the police is going to find the car, see the blood, and get super worried. And this is exactly what happened, according to the papers. Blood stains on both front and rear seats of Edward Bremer's automobile inspired fear for the safety of the 37-year-old bank president, held for ransom by kidnappers who have threatened to kill him. Edward's car was found by police shortly after 10 in the morning he was kidnapped. The authorities told the press that it was obvious from the amount of blood found in and on the vehicle that he was seriously wounded. Meanwhile, the kidnappers were reported to have made no effort to communicate with the family. This last bit wasn't actually fully correct. There were plenty of criminals, like small crooks, like other people in the area who wanted to get rich quickly and knew that this family has the money, but possibly did not have Ed Bremer or knew who had him. Like, they were sending the ransom notes to the family. So the family was getting ransom notes constantly. But the police kind of knew, like, how to filter through the 
right ones and we're like yeah none of these ransom notes are really correct so a lot of the ransom notes actually that the Barker Carvey's gang started sending were just deemed to be bogus until the family got the next one so like part of this note read when you are ready to meet our terms, place an NRA sticker in the center of each of your office windows. We'll know if the coppers are pulled or not. Remain at your office daily from now until 8 p.m. Have the dough ready and where you can get it within 30 minutes. You will be instructed how to deliver it. The money must not be had as it will be examined before Bremer is released. We'll try to be ready for any trickery if attempted. This is positively our last attempt. Don't duck it. $200,000, which would be over $3.5 today, was delivered to the spot in Farmington, Minnesota. And the next day, Bremer was released into the middle of the street in Rochester in total to count to 15 before finally removing the goggles that had been almost constantly taped to his face for three motherfucking weeks. Once he was interviewed by the police, this is what he would tell them. Like, he would say that the goggles weren't so perfectly taped. He also saw a crack in the wall of the bedroom. He heard a small child crying, about one year old, and another child of about four years old on the floor above. They suspect like, whether it's, you know, gang members' children and, like, their girlfriends might have been there. He would say that he heard a call in the kitchen area, as if, like, the fire was constantly on. Sounds of traffic and he thought he was placed rather the house where he was held was near a stop sign on a main highway due to the cars braking constantly that he heard the sounds of trains which kind of further like made him think that he was on the highway and there was like the rails were somewhere nearby he heard the older woman that was telling the kidnappers now you're thinking boys now you're thinking that this the police assumed would have probably been Ma Barker, that he traveled through a medium-sized city to the hideout as he would hear other cars in the busy streets and then it just sounded like he was on a highway, and that the car that was used when they transported him back was a one-seated vehicle. That after riding the short distance, he was then transferred to another car and that this second car was a sedan. He was forced to enter the sedan and sit on the floor immediately behind the driver with his back against the left rear door. At this time, his hand touched the butt of what appeared to be either a shotgun or a rifle on the floor. Imagine if we're just like, oh, I touched someone's butt. Whose butt was that? Oh my god, like... This just this gave me like criminal minds chills, you know, like when they were like, okay, just think what, what you were feeling, what you were sensing, what you were touching, like deploy your senses. Yes, your eyes were shut, but what could you sense in the space? I'm like, oh my god, like constantly think. I never want to be kidnapped, okay? But this would definitely be me. I'd be like, just remember all the details. What if you don't die and you have to tell somebody the story? They're gonna ask about everything. You're like, I have touched but like but so what or a rifle like oh creepier somehow creepier because like imagine if you touch the butt of an actual person you're like who the fuck was that who the fuck was that cool uh so he gave them a lot of information edward did well and his description of the house and the place where he was kept was actually exactly correct as ma's home was near the highway here and the boys did drive him through the city but it wouldn't be the clues that Ed gave the police that will get the family busted. Rather, another snitch. Once again, the money was collected by the gang, they had split the earnings and they scattered, and usually after these kidnappings they would really try to keep a low profile. However, the person that wasn't keeping a low profile was the shotgun, George Ziegler, one of the Al Capone guys that now was working with the gang, right? He was the guy that was kind of like, you know, like drinking in these taverns and started telling the tale. After telling many of the tales to the associates in Chicago that he was involved in the Bremer kidnapping, he was gunned down outside of the restaurant in Cicero, and his body was left in the street until the next day. Carpe Slater claimed that the syndicate was responsible. You know, it was the Al Capone guys, it was people in Chicago. We had absolutely nothing to do with that. And it's, again, just up to, like, 
what do you believe? We have seen in part one how the Barker Carp is gang dealt with the snitches and how they wanted to make examples of them, even if it was like their mother's lover. So the Barker Carp is gang, Pretty Boy Floyd and John Dillinger were all still on the loose. While Bonnie and Clyde had been killed, it was in an operation led by former Texas Ranger Frank Hamer, with no involvement with the FBI whatsoever. When it came to John Dillinger, this was a bit more interesting and a bit more of a fucker when it comes to the FBI. So the FBI mishandled the raid on the Dillinger gang at the Little Bohemia Lounge in Wisconsin, and this resulted in the loss of an agent's life. Most significantly, they failed to arrest a single member of the Dillinger gang. They managed to arrest one gang member's wife and a couple of girlfriends, convicting them on harboring charges. But all these women were released on parole shortly after. And these failures nearly cost J. Edgar Hoover his job. Even though the FBI was not even coming close to doing the job they had been hired to do, Ethel Carpis was just as cautious and paranoid as ever, and this general mood was starting to rub off on even the dumbest one of them all, Fred Barker. Elvin and Fred, because of this paranoia, start asking for recommendations for a particular doctor with a particular set of skills, okay? This next part is going to sound like a myth. And you know when you feel the pain on behalf of somebody else because they're fucking dumb and they engage with like the most tragic of individuals who then cause them pain? Yeah, this whole story is that. Because fingerprints, Fred and Doc now were given the name of a doctor that is gonna be called Dr. Joseph Moran. He was the underground physician. This doctor had previously served time in prison because he conducted some illegal abortions and then had become a hired surgeon among criminal circles. And if you're thinking like, oh, what, what is he gonna operate on? Fingerprints, yeah. He is going to be hired by the gang to remove their fingerprints so that they can't be compared with the ones that are on file. Genius, genius, how can you remove fingerprints? Yeah, that's the part that's painful. Cool. So when Fred and Elvin arrived at uh, Moran's office, the procedure began with Moran placing rubber bands around the first joints of Fred's fingers. He then prepared an antiseptic solution and applied it to Fred's fingerprints. As Parker's fingers started to become slightly numb, then the doctor administered cocaine injections to further numb them. With this done, he then carefully started removing the flesh from the tips of the fingers, just like sharpening a pencil. After about 10 minutes of slicing, he then wrapped Fred's fingers in bandages and administered a morphine shot, cautioning him that the pain would intensify in a few hours. Of course it is, there's no meat on the fingers. Moran then carried out a similar procedure on Elvin Carpis, but Elvin, you know how he was called old creepy, he was like, yeah, your face is like drooped on one side, let me just operate on your face. Never, never a good idea. You've just seen what he had done to your friends and gang members and gang associates' fingers. Don't let him touch your face. He did. He did. Because paranoia. Because he thought this is gonna help him not get caught. Dr. Moran then gave Elvin Carpis an injection of cocaine and then started making cuts on his face. Uh, the cuts kind of concealed his scars. I just, I don't know how they concealed his scars. Like, I just imagined that he had even more scars. But still, he was very much fucking recognizable. Afterward, both Fred and Elvin were in so much pain, mostly from having every finger on their hands mutilated, and they would fall in and out of consciousness for three full days. In the end, this extreme pain proved to be the waste of time and money. According to the FBI report, the dated November the 19th, 1936, Fred was a raving maniac due to the pain. Like with George Ziegler, like with Ma's boyfriend Arthur in part one, Dr. Moran just couldn't keep his goddamn mouth shut. He was way too excited about the job and just who he worked on. Like, he just wanted you to know that he had famous clients. You would as well. It's like celebrity operating on a celebrity of the time. Doing a shitty job doesn't matter. The word has to spread. But, of course, that has dire consequences when your famous clients are criminals. Elvin and Doc were to handle the situation. Elvin said in the book, 
Anybody who talks to whores is too dangerous to live. We dug a hole in Michigan and dropped him in and covered the hole with lye. I don't think anybody's ever going to come across Dr. Moran again. This is like Elvin's autobiography. He really doesn't have to do any of this. Like, this man is just... just complete disregard of human life. So, Carpis and Barker shot him in the head and dumped the doctor's ass in the hole in Michigan. And speaking of the fingerprints, other sources would say, specifically the FBI said that Dr. Moran's corpse was not dumped in a hole, but it actually washed up on the shores of Lake Erie a year later, missing its hands and feet. And if this is true, like we know previously, you know, with Arthur, Ma's boyfriend and stuff like that, they did possibly torture their victims before death. And in this case, with this doctor who put them through so much pain, right, for no reason, it might have been like an eye for an eye. You put us through pain, we do the exact same to you. Unfortunately for Fred and Alvin, their ordeal was in vain. The harm had already been inflicted. In February of 1934, the FBI agents managed to trace money from the Bremer kidnapping to a gas station. From there, they discovered the gas canister that had been used to refuel the vehicle used in Bremer's abduction. Because another thing that Edward Bremer had remembered was his kidnappers stopping somewhere to refuel when they escorted him to the spot where he was to be released. And this is where they had touched some of the gas cans and the fingerprints remained. And the prints on the gas cans matched Arthur Barker's. So now they had Doc. With Doc's fingerprints now, the FBI could actively pursue the Barker Carpius gang, moving the case up to the federal level. In the meantime, the Barker boys and their mother had been maintaining low profiles in Chicago ever since the ransom for Edward Bremer had been handed over. I mean, low profiles and low profiles, you know, they had had, like, a fucking whole cocaine-induced hangover with, like, their fingerprints being taken off, but sure, to each their own. It's like, hey, there's no adrenaline rush. I mean, we have just been, like, suffering in pain and, like, probably having hallucinations because of it for, like, days on end. But to pass the time, what they would also do is go to cinema to movie screenings. And to their shock and pride, not really horror, they soon found themselves watching their own faces on the big screen. This is now April 1934 in our timeline, and Elvin, in his autobiography, would speak of this, saying that the banners across the bottom of the screen would show up, and they would state, remember, one of these men may be sitting beside you. And according to Elvin, like, the lights would go on to the theater, everybody looked to their left, to their right, to see the face next to them match the pictures. And people were giggling. Like, they didn't believe that any public enemy could be sitting beside them. And Ma would smile at Fred and Elvin. And the three would just chuckle along with the audience. Elvin said that Ma had just got the first real confirmation that her boys were more than the ordinary crooks. So, you know, like that artist moment, when you see, like, Billie Eilish, when you see Taylor Swift at the era's tour, and you're like, oh my god, she has her, like, I made it moment. That was Ma Barker in this situation. She's like, oh my god, my boys, my boys are the most wanted. Yes, it's all I ever fucking wanted for them. Mother of the year over here. Mother of the fucking year. They're watching the movies. The FBI is after their ass. And this is where we come to the Ma might have been right all along moment. While the Barker Carpies gang was diligently trying to escape police detection, their girlfriends weren't as cautious. One evening, the romantic partners of Fred, Doc, and Elvin started to drink too much and created a disturbance at a nearby tavern. This commotion then resulted in the police being called, and one of the girlfriends mentioned the names of a couple of gang members that she might be associated with. She kind of did it in such a way of, like, if you don't let me and my friends go, you know, like, my boyfriend's gonna come for your ass. You don't know who I am associated with. And the police was like, oh, who is your boyfriend, girlie? Like, why are you threatening us with him? Who is this big boy? Who, who the fuck is him? And then they just, like, start bragging even more. So this disturbance marked the beginning of the downfall of the Barker Carpies gang. While the rest of the gang moved to Chicago and various locations down south, 
Doc Parker chose not to abandon his girlfriend. Because of this nice gesture, don't let the moral of the story be like, oh, yeah, he should have just dropped her ass. No, it's not the moral of the story. Moral of the story is don't commit fucking crimes and kill multiple people and be a sociopath about it. But January the 8th, 1935, Doc becomes the first member of the Barker Harpies gang to face the consequences of his crimes since the gang had officially formed about five years before. Federal agents conducted a raid on Doc's apartment, and they uncovered not only money from the Bremer Ransom, but also an extensive arsenal. Like, I don't even know how many pistols. Like, the, the boys in the last podcast of the left state, like, just, like, how many pistols, Tommy guns this guy had had, shotguns, substantial amount of ammunition that was capable of taking on significant portion of the FBI. So they arrest his ass, and following that, the FBI would get a vital clue pointing them in the direction of their next, next investigative lead. And this would be again in Doc's apartment. There was a postcard from Ocala, Florida. Again, again, I'm just gonna say it. This, this, this is not a young man's act, okay? This is not Fred, as dumb as he is. This is not Fred writing a postcard to his brother. This is an action of an elderly woman. Ma, why are you sleeping? Why are you sleeping, Ma? Why the fuck? They went to Cala, Florida. And then Ma is like, oh my god, let me send my boy a postcard. Are you dumb? You were most wanted. You went to the cinema and saw that you were most wanted. Why are you dumb? It's just a slip up. An old lady slip up. Just, oh my god, it pissed me off so much. I was like, why is this bitch sleeping? And also proves to you she was not a mastermind. Not a fucking mastermind. Yeah, Hoover. Mm, clearly not. Clearly not. You caught her on a technicality, boy. There were no names on this postcard, but it was very obvious for the FBI that Ma and Fred had fled to Ocala in Florida. By 1934, in our timeline, Bonnie and Clyde, Pretty Boy Floyd, and John Dillinger were all dead. So the FBI, and J. Edgar Hoover in particular, could focus full force on apprehension or killings. Like, they did not care whether or not these boys are gonna go peacefully of the Barker Carpies gang. Before his arrest, Doc seemed to have been on a mission to keep a couple of people's mouths shut. So he has silenced by killing them, yes, a couple of people before he was actually caught for his crimes. The first to go down was a guy called Russell Gibson, who had taken part in the Bremer kidnapping. Federal agents surrounded his building and hurled tear gas into his apartment before opening fire. Gibson tried running out, firing his pistol, but the gun jammed and agents filled him full of lead. The next guy was William Harrison. When they found William Harrison just after they killed Russell Gibson, all that was left was a charred corpse. And this might have been uh, because Doc Parker probably killed him and burned his body to keep him quiet. And remember the postcard that was sent to Doc? Well, Ma, Fred, and Elvin had been staying in Lake Weir, 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 Florida, somewhere in Florida, where nothing good fucking ever happens, okay? It's the only state in the US I have been to. I don't have the best memories. Anyways, <laughs> they were staying there under the last name Blackburn, but they had not kept a low profile. The people the locals knew as Blackburns paid for everything in large bills and wouldn't take change. One time a local barber said that three of these Blackburns got haircuts and they tipped him $50, which now you're like, oh, $50, okay. No, at that time that's about like $1,200. Like imagine just like, yeah, leaving that tip, like whatever the fuck you have, like you're like, I'm not taking change. Why would I do that? They had radios blaring in the car, you know, Cardi B blasting from the cars they were driving. Fred and Elvin, though, had a boat as well. And what they would do to lure, not fish, they wanted to lure an alligator out of this fucking lake. So they pulled a live pig behind them as a bait to lure out this alligator so they can shoot him with machine guns. They were doing the most. And this alligator stunt, yeah, with them like killing a fucking pig and then taking the pig as a bait to get the alligator out of the lake, yeah, that was too out of pocket. 
to out of pocket and it also caught the attention of the locals and then the locals when the investigators started asking for tips they were like oh yeah it's, it's the alligator guys over there like they're doing some weird ass fucking shit that are not fitting in whatsoever so the fbi agents reached lake weir on january the 16th 1935. elvin and several other gang members already left they were you know like out committing other crimes, but my and Fred chose to remain behind. They were conflicting accounts regarding whether anyone else stayed with them, and it still remains unclear whether it was just the two of them or if one or two other individuals were present. What is for sure is that at 5.30 a.m. FBI agents arrived at their location. They identified themselves as Department of Justice officials and requested that the Barkers surrender peacefully. After some time, the FBI claimed that they heard Ma asking who they were. And then they heard her say, all right, go ahead. So the agents thought that this meant like Ma and Fred are going to surrender, but they were wrong. Fred suddenly appeared in the front doorway and he was bareheaded in a white shirt and gray trousers and with a machine gun in his hands. As Fred's bullets started crashing towards the agents, Ma's high, shrill voice came like a cry of doom. Let them have it. Fred's machine gun fire was answered by tear gas bombs, rifle fire, and machine gun fire from weapons in the hands of the FBI agents. The ensuing gunfight would continue for hours, long enough for a crowd to gather outside. But at noon, the gunfire inside the house stopped. When agents edged inside the house, they said they found Ma Barker with her arm around her youngest son, both of them dead. Fred had been shot 11 times before he went down, but Ma had been killed by just one shot to the head, and it was reported that her pudgy hands still clasped an empty machine gun, implying that she had actually participated in this gunfight herself. When Ma Barker fell in the house, federal agents said she was holding machine gun in her hand and part of the drum of cartridges had been exhausted. The agents said they had fired 1,500 rounds of ammunition into the house. This is actual newsreel footage from January 16th, 1935 in what the press called the Battle of Oklahoma. It's the longest gun battle in FBI history. J. Edgar Hoover ordered a surprise attack on the infamous Ma Barker gang. Agents had caught one of the Barkers with a map leading to their Florida hideout. And Ma Barker and her bank-robbing, kidnapping, murdering son were in no mood to surrender. She was a tough cookie, and she didn't go down without a fight. They battled for more than four hours. One neighbor hid in his stove to dodge the gunfire, while another felt a bullet cut through her hair. And the bullets went through our house, and one went through my hair, and we went through the window. The FBI drilled more than 2,000 rounds into the house until Ma Barker and her son Fred stopped shooting back. This is the last stand. This is it. This is where they were both found dead on the floor. A good portion of the public was calling for the apprehension or death, again they did not care, just like the FBI agents didn't, or Fred Barker. So there weren't many objections of the FBI shooting him 11 times. The issue that the FBI faced, however, was that they had possibly killed an elderly woman with no criminal history. Following the previous debacle at the Little Bohemia raid, when they didn't catch the Dillingers, but during which an innocent civilian lost their life, J. Edgar Hoover was well aware that negative press coverage here could potentially cost him his job. This is why we have all of the quotes in the articles that I have read to you about Ma that came from the mouth of J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, because he really wanted for her to be the mastermind behind the whole operation, a criminal genius who had meticulously orchestrated every aspect from devising escape routes to selecting kidnapping targets, all while keeping a cigar clenched firmly between her teeth. This narrative was so captivating that, in collaboration with the FBI, papers crafted a new image of Ma Barker as a figure far more formidable and capable than the true portrayal of a simple, somewhat naive, music-loving individual who had been, at best, 
an accomplice. Ma had to be the mastermind in Hoover's words, but also the gang had to be so astute, so cunning, that this is why it had taken them so long to capture them. So J. Edgar Hoover remains steadfast in his assertion that the Barker Carpies gang was among the most intelligent criminal groups he had ever encountered, a statement that held true in his mind, because we have spoken about these boys for hours now. Did you ever hear me utter the word intelligent? No, mm -mm, absolutely not. However, Hoover would also maintain that Ma was the most astute among them, so shrewd that they never managed to gather any evidence against her, which explained the absence from the FBI records when it comes to Ma's file, and also like any sort of fingerprints, for example, or a mugshot of Ma Barker. The Ma Barker story also gave J. Edgar Hoover the opportunity to trot out one of his favorite lines. He said that the Barker story proved that the root causes of crime were not poverty, no, 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 it wasn't economic disparity, but the widespread deterioration of family values. To wrap up the saga on the house, because a lot of people like to know, like, oh, is anybody living there? Is it haunted? Like, what happened to the house? Right? So, before Ma came there to, like, rent out the house as, like, Blackburns, you know, with uh, Fred and then Elvin as well, the residence originally stood on land that was owned by a guy called Carson Bradford. He got the property in Oklahoma back in 1892. In 1930, his son, who lived in Miami, constructed a house. It was a two-story Florida cracker-style home, boasting three bedrooms and two bathrooms, with a total living space of 2,100 square feet. He never considered renting out this house on Lake Weir. However, in late 1934, he received an unexpectedly generous proposal from somebody who was acting on behalf of Mrs. T.C. Kate Blackburn. He went back. She went back to Kate in her last, one of her last decisions was to be like, I go back to Arizona, Kate Barker. She was described as a sweet little old lady in search of a secluded cottage where she and her sons could escape the harsh northern winter and unwind. The only time that he ever rented. This is the only time this man had ever rented this house, because somehow Ma worked her charm yet again just the way that she did when she was bringing up her kids and then saving them from the police as they were teenagers. Initially, Bradford declined the offer. He stated that the house was not available for rent, but Ma could not take no for an answer. So the offer was increased, and it was accompanied with an advance payment for the entire season in cash. So, of course, this guy had been stupid to say no. He said yes, and Ma moved in there with... Fred, and then Elvin, who just was out of town at this point. Two months later, the Bradford house was riddled with bullets, and is the scene of the longest FBI shootout in history. Only when the shooting was over did Bradford learn the true identity of his tenants. I believe that the house was preserved the way that it was, with the bullets riddling the walls as well, for years, allowing the public into the house only once, in 1985, for the 50th anniversary of the shootout. In 2016, the property where the Bradford house sits was sold to somebody called Kirk Boone. Is He's a trustee and was sold to him for $750,000. The new owner started debating on making money, opening the house up as an attraction, he even had an offer from an Orlando businessman to move the house to tourist-centric International Drive to make it an attraction there for, like, the tourists to go and see it and, like, to make money. And at the time, the house still had most of the original furniture and decor present during the shootout, so that's why this would have been, like, this would have worked as that, and people would have probably paid, like, top dollar to see it. The reason for the relocation and opening it to the public, well, at least on the website now, because you can, yes, book to go and uh, see Ma's house that honestly had been redecorated completely, so it doesn't really even look like the house obviously looked in 1935. 
but the reason was said to be to preserve the history of the area. They're not honoring the gangsters, they're honoring the first 12 FBI agents to sign up for the agency in the 1930s. So a Marion County tax collector, George Albright, worked for years to get the home into public hands. They had moved the house, kind of using like a barge, you know, like how they just like lift the whole house up and they move it like it's nothing, <laughs> it's fucking nothing, and they moved it about like 800 feet to the north end of the Lake Weir Chamber of Commerce property. It was to be donated to the county, and the county would own it permanently. The FBI found the bodies of two of America's most wanted gangsters, a scattered fortune in cash, and an arsenal of rifles, pistols, and Tommy guns. This is a hundred-shot uh, machine gun used by Ma Baca against a federal man in the raid. More than 80 years later, the walls are still riddled with bullet holes. Much of the house looks just as it did the day of the battle. I would say... 85 or 90 percent of what's in there today, piece by piece, are in the pictures. I mean, it's an amazing story. Anywhere there's a circle, there's been an FBI agent. And George Albright is trying to keep the story alive and the house in one piece. This was shot either out of a Thompson machine gun or a rifle. He's a former state lawmaker and history buff who fears this lakefront house could be knocked down for condos. It's for sale as we speak. I want to get this thing into public hands. Albright wants to turn this property into a history center and memorial to law enforcement. Yeah, there was a gangster killed there, but the good guys won. The American people won. America's gangster movement took off in the Great Depression, looting banks and running wild. J. Edgar Hoover was on the ropes. And Hoover called Ma Barker the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful criminal brain of her time. Historians say her sons may have been the real masterminds. But either way, the gang unleashed a reign of terror across the nation. This became a big win for the FBI. The Battle of Oklawaha marked the beginning of the end of the age of gangsters and the rise of the FBI. That means, gangsters, you can't get away with it. Hollywood has told a lot of stories about Ma Barker. I'm teaching my kids to take what they want. We're gonna start moving fast and big. I've never done a single thing that I'm ashamed of. She's the most dangerous woman in the U.S. today. But this house and all of the pictures and documents in it tell the real story. And now state lawmakers have to decide how or if to preserve it. Right now, the house is located in Kearney Island Recreation and Conservation Area. The home was moved there on that barge from Lake Weir into the Kearney Island in October 2016. It was then opened to the public as a museum in late 2017 or 2018, and it was set just prior to the movement of the house, like to them moving it with that barge, that there was a vintage ring that had the initials FB that was found when the team used metal detectors to scan the location, like before moving it, obviously. And the ring was presumed to have been owned by Fred Barker. And it has been added to the collection, along with several bullet casings and assorted paraphernalia. In 2018, the home was made into a museum, and many of the original furnishings are kept intact, but there have been several restoration efforts made since. Like, I have been posting, like, images as I was telling you this story, and you can really see, like, a lot of it has been redecorated. Like, obviously, like, the first set of images is in black and white, so I can't really speak much of the color, but it doesn't look like the shootout scene anymore. You can request a tour on their website, and many people, of course, believe that the place is haunted. And I don't know, I, I, this is where I think I differ to like a lot of people who are like, oh my god, I want to see the ring, I want to see Fred Barker's ring, I want to see this perfume, I want to see the bullet holes. I'm like, no, I, I really don't. Hey, I don't want to be in a possession of any sort of like merchandise that belong to like serial killers and shit. But also, I don't want to like, no, I don't want this energy. I don't want to meddle into a house. Like even if I were in Florida, you know, Marion County, I'm like, yeah, no. I... I don't wanna. I don't wanna. Like, you know, I had been thinking about it, like, especially with, like, Cecil Hotel, right? It's like, yeah, like, it, you know, you stay there and, like, it's eerie vibes. You, like, stay for the adventure. Now, as I'm getting older, I'm like, no. 
I don't want to like die a stupid ass fucking death just because like I went into a place or just like what if, what if there's such a haunted energy that like it remains with you, it sticks with you then for the rest of your life. I don't want to meddle with that. Mm -mm. You bring me to a place that is known for just like entertainment, for the good vibes, not like a place where like people have been shot to death. Like I don't want to see that shit, I don't want to be in the presence of fucking death and ghosts, no. No, like, what if you jinx your whole fucking life after that? Could not be me. Anyways, so this is the saga of the house. Back in our timeline, right, 1935, Fred and Ma are now dead. Doc is in jail. But there is still a hunt for somebody who wasn't in Ocala, Florida, and that somebody was Elvie. The FBI still had one significant target left to capture in order to conclude their campaign against crime. And that target was Elvin Carpis. But the manhunt for him was not as exciting as some would have wanted. Many of the major criminals had already been arrested or killed. The Barkers, Pretty Boy Floyd, Bonnie and Clyde, resulting in a decreased enthusiasm among agents to put their lives at risk in the campaign that appeared to have already achieved victory. Elvin Carpis held the title of the public enemy number one for a whole year eluding authorities by constantly moving between cities, engaging in car hijacking, seeking refuge in brothels, and stealing payrolls when the opportunity arose. But finally, in the spring of 1936, the FBI caught up with Carpis in New Orleans. On May the 2nd, a team of agents surrounds the house where Carpis was suspected to be staying, but him and his associates were just out on a grocery store run. And this was said to be like because they were craving strawberries, which is just... It's like, oh, they're gangsters, but they still have the normal cravings, just like you and me. They're just like us. And as they were returning, they sensed that something was off. So Carpis rolled down his car window, like without exiting the car, but an agent recognized him and swiftly moved to block Carpis in. According to J. Edgar Hoover's account, Hoover himself leaped out of his car, seized Carpis by the collar, and apprehended him before Elvin could reach for his gun. On the other hand, according to Elvin Carpis, who a lot of more, a lot more people trust Elvin Carpis compared to like J. Edgar Hoover, which is fucked up. It's it's fucked up, okay? But um, it's it's the truth and. According to Elvin, J. Edgar Hoover was not present. He was nowhere near the location as Elvin was being apprehended. Rather, he appeared later to claim credit after the situation had stabilized. The New York Times front page headline the next day said, Carpis captured in New Orleans by Hoover himself. Hoover himself would make the announcement simply stating, We've captured Elvin Carpis, generally known as public enemy number one. But not to us. They were taken without firing a shot. First of all, I love the pronouns. That's so modern of him. They, them. Yeah, it's like, that's what it's, maybe he's, you know, using different type of pronouns. But also, as people on TikTok would say, he thought he ate. He <laughs> was like, yeah, this is me owning the situation, whereas people are like, no, you weren't even there, my man. You were nowhere near the fucking sea. The article then continues to state more intelligent men than he, and braver men too, took him into custody. Came the time for his trial, Carpis found that defending his kind had become less popular, that the law was less flexible, and that a case had been made against him. He could not, as his jargon has it, beat the rat. So he pleaded guilty to kidnapping. The day of the gangster, like Ma Barker and her boys, are gone from America. The criminal had found out that the law means business. And when the law means business, the criminal, however notorious, whatever his one-time power, cannot go on. <laughs> News reports of the time say Hoover did the job personally. It's rumored or uh, reported that J. Edgar Hoover was instrumental in your arrest. Is there any truth in that? <coughs> Is there any truth in that? You would better ask Mr. Hoover. You have no grudges? Grudges? Uh, with who? Uh, grudges against uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Why, well, I never did have.
with Elvin and Doc behind bars, Mind Freddy dead, and many of the other gangsters arrested and awaiting trial or being pursued by government officials, the FBI believed that the American public could begin to feel safe again. As for Doc, after a short stay in Leavenworth, Doc Parker was sent to Alcatraz, and he will be killed there in the Alcatraz escape attempt years later, in 1939. I found this documentary on the Alcatraz escape, in particular focusing on the Doc Barker situation and his escape attempt on like, how they cut through the bars and almost, almost made it to the water. I'm going to um, play it now for you so, to, so that you can have a break from this lovely voice, because the narrator there has such, such a, like, a lot better of a tone of voice than I ever will. In 1939, one inmate attacks the bars in a unique way. Convicted gangster Arthur Doc Barker, son of the infamous Ma Barker, is a murderer, kidnapper, and armed robber. He receives a life sentence on Alcatraz. A few years later, Doc spots a way out and begins plotting his escape. He's locked up in the D-Block isolation unit. D-Block is one of two cell blocks federal authorities fail to upgrade with the tool-resistant bars. The reason they didn't upgrade the entire cell house to the tool-proof steel was simply a matter of economics. This was an old aging building, and the money only went so far in the depths of the Depression. With a smuggled hacksaw blade, Doc and four accomplices saw their flat D-Block cell bars so they can enter and leave as they want hiding the cuts with paint. They would push them down and then were able to call through. But Doc and his gang still need to get through the round window bars. These tool-resistant bars are much stronger than the flat bars. The tool-resistant bar is nearly impossible to saw through with a standard saw. The reason? Hardness. A tool-resistant bar has more carbon, which makes the metal harder. When a bar is heat-treated and quickly cooled, the atomic structure shifts, making it more difficult for a blade to cut. Heat treating has been around for a long time. Any blacksmith who makes horseshoes or a swordsmith has been using it for years and years and years. Hundreds of years. Thanks to the added carbon and heat treatment, the tool-resistant bars on Alcatraz are about the same level of hardness and strength as a hacksaw blade, the very tool many inmates would use to try to cut the bars. Whenever one tries to cut something with a material of the same strength or less, it can't do it. It's like trying to cut concrete with concrete. You can't do it. You need something stronger. Doc's solution is ingenious. He has other cons build and smuggle a bar spreader into the cell house, a crude mechanical device that uses pressure to break the bars. A bar spreader is essentially like a car jack, and as you crank it and it opens, it's going to put an enormous amount of force on the bars and spread them. They would break because they're fairly brittle compared to mild steel. January 13th, 1939. Doc and his four accomplices slip out of their pre-cut cells and snap the window bars with the bar spreader. Now, outside the cell house, they head to the water and begin building a driftwood raft. Suddenly, guards spot them. Shots ring out, and four of the five men surrender. But it's too late for Doc. Doc Parker was shot in the head. He did not make it. The escape attempt is a tragic failure, but Doc and his associates found a way through the maze of cell house bars. They almost made it to the water, which is when Doc was shot to the head. It was said that he just continued running towards the water, towards this raft, and before he was shot, he said, I'm crazy as hell, I should have never tried it. He will end up being hospitalized, but he was bleeding internally, and he would die in the hospital shortly after. The cause of death was said to have been a fracture of a skull. Doc would be buried in an unmarked grave in San Francisco's Coloma Cemetery, on January the 16th, 1939. And the residents in this area would breathe a collective sigh of relief with this announcement that the prisoners' escape obviously didn't go according to their own plan. Doc's criminal background at the time was all blamed on Ma and the way that she was bringing up the kids. The papers at the time would say about his life. Had his home environment been different, Doc might never have been 
any more of a serious menace than any other mischievous boys. He might never have murdered a fellow man. He might not now be among the most degraded dead, but happily living, leading sons of his own in fishing and hunting expeditions like those his father planned for him before his doting mother interfered. And although I agree, like, listen, you cannot convince me that someone's home life will not define who that person is going to grow up to be, like, their personality traits, like, how they make their decisions, their values, all of that stands. But we also need to fucking acknowledge free will in this story. Like, I don't think that Ma was sitting next to each and every one of them at any point with, like, the gun to their head being, like, go and rob a fucking bank. Like, they could have at some point fucked off with their dad. They could have left. That man had free will, even though he was in this whole fucking family, and he just picked up his shit and left. There was some free will that could have been executed, deployed, and they could have just gone and gotten normalized jobs, or, like, robbed a couple of places and then lived off, off of that money. They didn't have to continue or do anything could have just led a normal, decent fucking life, but that's not what they did. So after Doc's daring escape, the other gang members are going to meet one of the two fates, either death by cop or Alcatraz. And regarding the fates of Ma and Fred Barker, even after their deaths, they faced a final indignity. Their bodies, marred by bullet wounds, were preserved in ice and exhibited in Florida as a macabre tourist attraction for a period of eight months. I cannot imagine the smell. I'm sorry, but, like, this is so, so bizarre to me. Probably one of the most bizarre things, but it was done. Because the FBI wanted people to know what happens when you mess with the fucking agents, when you mess with the authorities. And they also thought that this is going to get, like, other gangsters to, like, come and, like, out themselves as if. Like, again, they were just, like, everybody's, like, more stupid than us. We are smarter than everybody. Yeah, if you display mine, Fred, dead, that, like, the gangsters are going to love to want to see that. Like, why would they want... <sighs> Anyways, somehow it was very popular, yes, with the tourists. And there are pictures of this. This ice down bodies. But no gang members showed, as will come as... Probably not a surprise to anybody else, because why the fuck would they owe themselves? Further, right, now, like, they're going to have a funeral, where, again, the FBI thought, oh, this is going to be another great opportunity for us to have helicopters, to have, like, everybody, like, all of the agents there, because, again, the gangsters, the gangsters are going to come out of hiding. Again, just not what had happened. So after eight months of... Ma and her youngest boy being displayed in a room that probably smelled worse than anything you have ever smelled in your fucking life. George Barker, Fred's dad and Ma's ex-husband, would actually arrange the transportation for the bodies of Ma and Fred to Oklahoma for burial. Both of them were laid to rest in Welch beside the eldest Barker, Herman. And only about 50 people came to their funeral, no gang members again had showed, despite of, like, you know, the helicopters and the agents being present. And one thing that I like about that, I guess, is, like, I tell these stories, right, and when it comes to, like, different victims, you have, like, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people showing up for the funeral to pay their respects. But here, I'm like, okay, at least what I like is that, yes, Gangsters are not coming out of hiding. Like, fuck that. It's like nobody's actually respecting these guys. Nobody is, you know, showing up in attendance. So, like, oh my god, we glorify these criminals. No. It was literally just their family and they were just put in a grave. You know, like, they didn't even have gravestones for the longest time. It was said that um, only, like, after basically some tourists would start coming into the town... And the locals were pissed off, like, them constantly asking, like, oh my god, the Barkers, where were they buried? It's only then that they were given some sort of a gravestone so, like, the tourists can find them on this cemetery. According to the last podcast on the left, boys, Herman was actually the one who got a really nice headstone back in the day. It says Barker, it says Herman, it's very much in the 1920s style. But with Ma and Fred, they just put them in the ground. And you can tell years later, someone just paid for a single marble block 
that just said Kate, Ma Barker and Fred Barker, because people were getting tired of others in Welch or tourists asking where the graves are. In January 1936, it was time for the courts to decide what is to be done with their belongings. Their estate, that was estimated at $20,000, was awarded to Ma's long-suffering husband. After paying legal fees and, like, delinquent storage unit bills, court costs, administration expenses, George Barker got about $1,100, which is about $20,000 today, but he was happy with that, and he just said, like, basically, I don't need much to live on. With the estate settlement outcome published, uh, Hoover obviously had to make a statement himself, saying that uh, the way of the transgressor, meaning offender, is hard. The average woman has a natural dread of any kind of violence, but once started on the road, outside the law, she becomes just as desperate as a man. She accepted a life of crime by choice. The Barkers killed for the fun and never learned what the word mercy meant. Like, <laughs> this man, every single time somebody shoves a microphone into his fucking face, or a journalist is like, hey, can you make a statement? He's a like, fucking Ma Barker, okay? She was a fucking master Ma. I hated that bitch. I'm like, we, we got a point. We got a point. It's almost as if you, sir, want us to believe this woman was a mastermind and her sons were just followers. <laughs> it's almost as if you have an agenda. I, I don't know. It's almost as if, like, you have to, something to prove. Just every single time. It's like, this is about an estate settlement. It's about, like, the money being given to the dead. He's like, so, have you heard about Ma Barker, though? Like, yeah, we have. Out of your fucking mouth. Quite a few times, actually. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Out of everybody here. I kind of feel for the dead for George Barker. And I know, like, I shouldn't, but, like, there was a point in this story that I'm coming to where I kind of cried. And I don't know why. Like, right, he was a dad. He did have the responsibility to jump in sometimes when it comes to their upbringing and, like, possibly, like, spite mind could have possibly turned these boys towards the right ways. But again, he did get out. Like, and I don't blame him. I can't fucking blame him when, like, you live in a household of, like, Ma and then the four other individuals that are clearly not going to listen, not going to change. I also kind of can't blame him. So what he did, like, after, obviously, the money was given to him from the estate, he um, lived the rest of his life on that money, and he lived out the final days working at a filling station. Occasionally, when a tourist who knew about Ma and his sons would stop and ask about the infamous family, he would just say they were good boys. Ma, she loved them to death. Until his passing at the age of 76, George would contribute $10 a year to the upkeep of his family's graves. You would think that's that on the family. However, no. Doc, you remember, like, Alcatraz escaped, happened in 1939. He was shot um, to death, and, like, obviously, the cause of death was fracture of the skull. Following the autopsy, they made a face mold of Doc. I put Y in capital letters, because Hoover, the director of the FBI, this is why people believe Alvin Moore, okay? Because Hoover would keep mementos of the shot faces of gangsters that he had caught. He went full on Jeffrey Dahmer, like, what do you mean? You would go into J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, you would go into his office and he would have molds of the faces of the gangsters with the bullets in them. I, that's like the creepiest fucking thing ever. I would just immediately retrieve. I'd be like, I'm sorry, I just... <laughs> this is bad, Georgia. What do you mean? Like, are you an actual sociopath? Like, God, it's like serial killer vibes. We are somehow not done speaking about how men need better hobbies. So to end the saga of the gang, right? We now have Ma and her favorite son, Fred, in the grave. We have Herman, who died years ago. Lloyd will eventually be released and then killed by his wife, as we mentioned in part one. Doc tried to escape from jail, was killed in the process, and then the mold of his face ended up in the director of the FBI's office. You know, just the, the usual. 
As for the gang leader himself, Elvin Carpis was also at Alcatraz, where he spent 25 years causing absolute havoc. He engaged in fights, he refused to work, he would always be caught with contraband, and display violent behavior towards prison officers. But then, in 1969, Elvin was granted parole, and then deported to his native Canada. He soon moved to Spain, and this is where he would author two completely unapologetic autobiographies. He died in 1972, becoming the last surviving member of the notorious Barker Carpis gang. In his autobiography, Elvin said, There are no apologies, no regrets, no sorrows, and no animosity. What happened, happened. This man killed over a dozen people. And he's just like, let the bygones be bygones, it's in the past, who the fuck is? You took so many human lives, and there's just absolutely fucking no regret. Like, I think it's very visible from the interviews that we watched. This man was a stone-cold murderer. Completely. Zero apologies. Two books, not a single apology. Putting Elvin's autobiographies on the side, this is how the book that I have read on this case by Chris Enns concludes the saga on Ma Barker and her boys. At the extreme north side of the Williams Timber Hill Cemetery, well away from the other graves and family plots, lie five graves defined by one stone marker and four small metal markers. The four small, glass-fronted metal markers, which contain lines of typed verse, implore a merciful rest for a mother and sons who found no peace in life. Ma Barker and her sons continued to live on in pop culture and, in my opinion, were worshipped more beyond their brutal deaths. So, let us speak about it. Like, obviously, the most portrayals of Ma in particular happened during 1940s and 1950s. Ma Webster, that was played by Blanche Yurka in the 1940 film Queen of the Mob, is based on Ma Barker. Changes in the names and depiction of events were the request of the FBI. Then there was the character in 1949 film called White Heat, and then a TV series Gangbusters in 1952. In 1970, there was a low-budget film called Bloody Mama that starred Robert De Niro. Even Disney's Duck Tales included episodes about a band of bad dogs that were led by Ma Beagle. Oh, Papa! Papa! This is Ma Barker and her boys. They do a lot of different things. They love people, all kinds of people, and they have a mother who understands. All right, now everybody reach for the night. This is Bloody Mama, the incredible saga of Ma Barker and her boys, the most bloodthirsty killers in the history of crime. That might have been the last reference along the song of the top of the episode by Boney M from 1977 called Ma Baker and also Anne Ramsey's character, Mama Fratelli, in the 1985 Richard Donner film, The Goonies. Is that all? Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Mm. Uh. You broke the witch! <laughs> you want to play pirate? We'll play pirate! No, no, no. Keep oh going, Smarty! As for the most recent references, I've read also about a band that was formed in 2004 that's called Maylene and the Sons of Disaster, and they have named themselves after the group of criminals and their songs are based on the gang's history. I kind of listened to some and I was like, I don't think I get it, right? So I read what they have said about the name of the band. Band member Dallas Taylor said, Maylene and the Sons of Disaster is made up of five dudes who play the role of the Barker Sons. And in these songs, we speak as though we were them, telling any who would listen that the life lived unjustly will meet divine justice on the other side. What the fuck is going on outside? We also wanted to think of the most crazy backwoods theme possible for this band. Since Ma was backwoods and we are backwoods, this is the way it had to be.
I don't know. Like, what are your thoughts? If my neighbors stop, like, fucking punching whatever the fuck they're punching, what are your thoughts on the pop culture representation of the gang? Like, in some cases, you know, like, from the trailers and little clips here and there, I think, like, okay, maybe they're really killing Ma, like, cool, cool, we are really killing criminals, okay, making fun of them, but then sometimes I'm like, but why? Are we portraying them? Like, is it to really kill them? Like, why are you naming a whole band and, like, again, uh, supposedly creating songs that are kind of based off of them? I don't know. Have you seen, like, the representation of the gang in any form, anywhere? And what was your immediate afterthought? Like, I would love to know. Like, have you seen, like, I don't know, a good retelling of the story or, like, a good representation of Ma Bark in the movie? Or, like, yeah, fuck that. That was that was accurate? I don't know. Like, can it be accurate? Because as I'm telling you, like, a lot of these stories just passed on, and you know when something is passed on from generation to generation, a lot of, yes, the factual information gets lost, and everything is kind of like in the form of a myth, in the form of a legend. That brings us to the end of this story, because Ma's representation in pop culture is controversial, but one thing that still holds the main controversy is Ma's leadership over the gang. The popular image of her in these movies and series portray her as the criminal mastermind of the gang, with a Tommy gun in her hands. But the historians find this to be fictitious, and they're skeptical Ma participated in any violent crimes, especially the final shootout in which she was killed. Elvin believed this story was encouraged by J. Edgar Hoover to justify killing an old woman and spread a narrative of the most vicious, dangerous, and resourceful woman of the decade. There is no conclusive proof that Ma led the gang. She knew what they were up to and helped them before and after they committed their crimes. This at least turns her into an accessory. Under different aliases, she rented houses, paid bills, and shopped, enjoying the fruits of those violent crimes. Her participation in her son's criminal careers might have been limited to the function of traveling with them to present the family unit under a veil of innocence. Because what could be more innocent than a mother taking care of her sons? Had the gang not crossed paths with its leader, Alvin Carpes, had they not gone under the protection of the authorities in St. Paul, would I be telling you the same story today? Would the legend of Ma Barker have lived on for generations? There were no mugshots or fingerprints taken of Ma while she was alive, so she might not have been the most wanted criminal the FBI portrayed her to be, but she will go down in history as one of its most known accomplices. And that is the story of Ma motherfucking Barker. Tits were not calm. There was something in that food. Would I? Okay, okay, if you had a chance, right, would you have liked to try one of Ma Barker's dishes? <laughs> you know, like with these kidnappings, everybody being like, oh my god, compliments to the chef, she was a great cook. I'm like, hmm, what was she cooking? I mean, what food can you really make? In 1920s, 1930s, they would be like, oh my god, this is deliciously delicious meal. Mm, mm, I mean, it was south, right? <sighs> I don't know. I don't, like, I, I just don't know. I'm just thinking, would I have liked to do... I'm just thinking, right? Because there's so many people that are interested in going to this museum, well, like, her previous house, right, where he was sure what the fuck is going in the neighborhood. There's just, like, so many people that, like, want something to do with this saga and this story, and the only thing that I would have possibly wanted was to be like, but can I, can I have a recipe? <laughs> so sad. It's actually pathetic. But, like, would those meals have been delicious? Probably not. Just say my unknown. Probably not. But if anything, that's where I would be like, okay, let's at least like try one of the recipes. If I want anything to do with this saga, that's it. That's my takeaway. I think you're just hungry, man. I think like you just want like dinner. <laughs> you just want to eat, girl. Like 
it's, it's okay to say that. I don't want anything to do with this story. Not like paraphernalia. I don't want to see Fred Barker's ring. I don't want to see that fucking house. I don't want any of that bad juju in my fucking life. So no, actually maybe I wouldn't want a fucking recipe. What if like there's a recipe book in that house? You don't cook, like I barely cook. <laughs> I can barely make eggs. I don't know where, why I started this story, but would you? Would you want anything to do with it? Have you gone to see the house? Would you want to? Would you want anything to do with this saga? And if so, what part? And why? Again, why? Why do we represent these people in this way throughout the pop culture? And we're like, oh my god, we need this matriarch. Can we guess the matriarch? Cut? Like, we need this to be the saga, to be the thread. We don't. We don't. They committed crimes, they died. Nobody really won. The FBI wanted to portray them one way. We see it for what it is. We see the whole story for what it is. The criminals committing crimes, and then obviously the authorities wanted to make a big deal out of it so that they look better. That's it. That's what this two-parter was about. <laughs> Could have been. I love how it's like, this could have been a 20 minute video, but however, you can now sit with me for about four hours. So tell me, do you want anything else from this story? Do you want any recipes? <laughs> I will see you in about two weeks' time. <laughs> do you want recipes? You don't cook, bitch. My out. Like, would you start cooking for my bar? No! Absolutely fucking not. You also what you want to make. You can make eggs this morning, but you want to make a 1920s meal. <laughs> like a 1930s meal that was served to kidnapped victims. No, you don't. No, you don't. Don't lie to yourselves and others. Look them in the eye. Do you want that? No. Glad we had this talk. Glad we had this talk. My out. <laughs> this is so special.